My name is Isaac Abib. Uh, I live in South Africa in Cape Town. Originally I was born in the Congo and my parents were from Rhodes Island. I uh, come to Rhodes every summer for four to five months to actually speak about our parents, to speak about Jewish life in Rhodes, uh, a Jewish life that has actually uh, been eradicated uh, at the end of the Second World War. Uh, my mother was born here. Uh, she was taken to the camps at the age of 18 uh, with the rest of the Jewish community of Rhodes. This took place on the 23rd of July 1944. My father, on the other hand, left Rhodes in 1937 and uh, made his way to the Congo uh, to actually the, the, the reason for going there was for economical reason to better the life and uh, help families uh, economically. My mother uh, was transferred from Auschwitz to various camps but was liberated on the 15th of April uh, 1945 by the British Army. Uh, 100 girls of Rhodes entered Bergen-Belsen uh, three months before, but only 15 were alive when the British uh, came and liberated them, but five of them died of the consequences of the, of, of, of the Shoah. Um, How old were you when you first learned about uh, her story? Uh, my, Early recollection is in the Congo. I was sitting in a lounge, I remember very well, on the armrest of the armchair, and I saw her number on her arms, and I asked, what was this number? And she told me that was a telephone number in Rhodes Island. So I thought I would do the same. So I remember exactly the number I wrote on my arm, it was 3831, the telephone number from home, and uh, I went to school and that day we had Hebrew and the teacher shouted at me like, a, and I remember her words, she said I had committed a mortal sin. I couldn't understand why my mom could have a phone number in Rhodes Island and I couldn't have my phone number written on my arm in the Congo. And this is my first recollection. And you were six? Six or seven, yeah. And. Sorry, I, uh, yeah. is there any way to turn off your cell phone signal? Oh, okay. I also yeah. have a cell no. No, it's my cell it's phone signal. It's like incoming sound, you know that's okay. in there? Just okay. Like, no, I, I, I have the, all the questions here. I, I know the questions <laughs> already, but I, I like to yes. make sure that if he misses something, that I can go back and, and... But I'm good now, okay? You don't want it to start from the beginning. You're just going to take it from... No. Okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. So tell me when you, you learned the rest of the story. Look, uh, we, there was a time where we only heard about, about concentration camp, but nothing more. There was a very long time of silence where I recall when people used to mention about someone that survived the camp, they would say in Ladino, in a hush voice, they would say, si salvo del campo, it means she was in the camps, but never clearly, like if it was almost a sin. Very difficult to, to understand that. Uh, and it's only truly when I was in South Africa, uh, already in my 20s, even more, that more and more people started to call, talk about the camps, the concentration camps, uh, Auschwitz and all that. Prior to that, we just knew our mothers or my mother, like a lot of parents or mothers in the Congo were survivors, but we never spoke much about it. It came much, much later. And did it affect you emotionally? Do you remember how it uh, affected you as a, as a teenager, as an, an adult? Uh, I don't think so. As a teenager, no, because they didn't speak much. Uh, actually, no. It's much later, 
uh, it affected me actually very, very late. Uh, how did I come about? When I was 35, I decided that I would learn Italian. So I put myself through university and uh, learning Italian, my father came to me and said, oh, well, what a wonderful thing you're doing. I have a very special document I want to show you. I couldn't understand what is, what is all this about. And he gave me my mother's testimony. We actually had at home her testimony done, done in December 1945, and I knew nothing until the age of 35. I knew nothing. I knew she was in the camps. I knew that there are no words in the dictionary that can describe anything. No words exist to be able to transmit or tell them, or tell to the people what they went through. As a matter of fact, when I speak of her, I actually take her testimony and I read her passages so that it's her through me that I speak to people. And do you feel like it's um, created a, a sense of mission in your life? Definitely. It happened after she passed away. No, already maybe before, because after what I saw the movie, that? after I saw the movie, she was, I told you at 35 I got the testimony. It was in Italian, I read it, I understood, I didn't have the courage to ask questions, but it affected me quite a lot. And then I, I, when the movie Shinless List came out, I decided that I really should do something about it. So I, uh, I decided that I will have it translated in French and English, and uh, in order to be able to, to read, and not only read and try to understand, and find the answers that I never had the courage to ask. Do you have siblings? Yes, I have two brothers. And they're, what is their relationship to the, the, your mother's story? They're more distant. I can see that out of three, there's all, out of the three brothers, or sometimes in a family, there's always one that is more affected. Maybe because I lived longer with them. Uh, my, my brothers, one lives in France, the other one lives in the Congo and my parents came to join me in South Africa 10 years after I had immigrated there. And uh, I was living not with them, but they were always around me. And also in the same building where they lived, there were four survivors from Rhodes Island living in the same building. So often they used to talk about that and I used to then really listen, but never had the courage to ask questions. Was there something that the story of your mother's life that made you interested in studying about her life in Rhodes, the languages, the poetry, the music, the culture of Rhodes? Look, uh, yes, because first of all, uh, we were, you need to understand, number one, in the Congo, the Jews in the Congo were all, 99% were originating from Rhodes Island. So we had that in culture. So we were brought up. Amazing. And nobody phones me. Sorry. Hello? Yes. I am here now. I am at, I am at, uh, they're interviewing me. I will close everything, don't worry. Okay, bye-bye. No one phones. Now you have to turn it off. No one phones. Okay. I know nobody here. Power of, and that was Carmen. Okay, so take it back. Take it back, but the impetus is gone a little bit. Okay. I know. So, um, the culture, what I'm interested in is understanding um, how you wanted to understand the culture of Rhodes, even though you're living in the Congo, even though la later you're living in, in South Africa, but you wanted to understand the culture of Rhodes, the Jewish Rhodes. How did that start? 
Look, it was always in me, but probably it started, I think, strongly when my mother passed away and my father. They passed away six months apart, okay? It's uh, 11 years for the one and 10 years after. And I also was a teacher, that was my profession. And we always a little bit too inquisitive and we always want to learn. And um, I became more and more interested. And they, in South Africa, they opened the Holocaust Center. I started to go there. But on top of it, in being a teacher, I was a teacher of language, but also a teacher of history and geography. And then more and more, I started to read about the Shoah. The Holocaust Center being open, I got more and more involved. And something interesting, when I started to come here in Rhodes, the first time I came here in 1965, I came back, I came for the first time with my mother, my father, the whole family came here on a holiday. And that's the first time that I saw Rhodes. I, I, I was only a boy of 14, but I entered my mother's house. I remember her crying. I, I, it was so strong. The vision was so strong. The emotion was very, very strong. I came back 10 years later to Rhodes again on a holiday and I managed to trace the house. And the person that was living there allowed me in again, but then I was already in my 20s. And I took pictures and I spoke about it and I, I got very, very emotional again. And I started to come on the early uh, period, that's not the right word, oh, yes. but on the early, but not for the synagogue. And I used to come to Rhodes and the thing that annoyed me is that I could never see in any of the guide books anything written on the Jews of Rhodes. So I used to tap on shoulders of people and ask them, would you like me to tell you about the Jews of Rhodes? And it grew. It grew more and more. And uh, eventually I started to even do more research and uh, get very, very involved on, on, on Rhodes, on culture, on the Shoah especially. And uh, can you share with us some, some of the things that um, you've written or that you've uh, uh, put together about the language of Ladino and the culture of Rhodes? Yes. Uh, you, I, I want to, let you, to tell you about eight years ago, I was in Rhodes with a whole bunch of friends from Cape Town. We came for a fantastic holiday, you know, full of wind. We're going to spend a... And we were walking in the old city and already I knew quite a lot of the places that Jews used to frequent, where a synagogue was, where the Jewish, the, the Jewish school was. And we were walking around. Eventually everybody left and I remained alone in the old city. And I can remember so vividly, I was right at the edge of the Jewish quarter and what used to be the Muslim quarter. Both of them is, used to be Jewish quarter and Muslim quarter. And that street was called La Caille de los Shastris, which means the street of the tailors. And I, at that moment, instead of being, there was music going around, loud music, people enjoying themselves, and I became very, very morose. I had the opposite reaction. And luckily at that moment, I had a pen, a piece of paper, and I started to write, and I started to write, and eventually I produced my book in Ladino, in Judeo-Spanish. And I'll never forget, the first poem was, I am in the street of the tailor, in La Caille de los Shastris. Could you read us? Would you like me to yeah. read that? Sure. And this was the first poem I wrote when I was here. Uh, page six. And from there it went on and it says, shall I read it in Spanish? Read it in okay. Ladino. In Spanish? In Ladino? Yeah. Okay, because that's how I read it. Right. And, okay. En la calle de los chastres está caminando. Las máquinas de cosir no cantan más. Las chastras ya no se pinchan más los dedos. Solo siento música alegre y la gente canta, grita, bebe, come, se ríe, baila. No tuvieron mortallas los que las cosían. El dumán se los llevó por los cielos alejados. La chica Jerusalén de preto está vestida. Y ellos cantan, gritan, beben, comen, se ríen y bailan en la calle 
que fue la de los chastres. En tierra ajena me siento, ajeno, no por dentro de mi alma. I'm taking a walk in the street of the tailors. The sewing machines no longer sing. The streamstresses no longer prick their fingers. I can hear joyful music. And people are singing, shouting, drinking, eating, laughing, dancing. Those that sewed the shrouds had none. The smoke took them on the faraway skies. The little Jerusalem is dressed in black. And yet they sing, shout, drink, eat, laugh and dance in the old street of the tailors. I feel in a foreign land. Foreign land, not in my soul. And this is where I started to write in Ladino. I didn't know I could do that, but I have done that year after year. Did, did your family speak Ladino at all? Yes, my parents spoke Spanish, Ladino. That was the language that, that was, was the speaking. language that they spoke among Yes, them. Ladino, sometimes Ladino French, mm. broken French. We never addressed to them in Ladino unless we didn't want a non-Jew to understand. Mm. So I was exposed to that language from my younger age. As a matter of fact, I've got to tell you that one of the things we did in the Congo that came from Rhodes, and to this day, we do in Cape Town in the Sephardic synagogue, which carries the same name from here, we do the Neila in Ladino. So to please the Israelis, we do it twice in Ladino, so we wouldn't lose our roots, and in Hebrew for the Israelis, or for everybody else, let's put it that way. Do you have children? No, I was never married. Did uh, your siblings have children? Uh, my brother in France has a, boy, uh, a son, yes. He's, he's a doctor, he's, uh, he has. And the other brother is married, but never had uh, children. Did the doctor ever express as a grandson of uh, this illustrious family ever express interest? I don't think so. You need to understand, he, he grew up in France. He saw my parents two weeks every two or three years. So he vaguely knew about it. And I don't think he asked many questions. And unfortunately, contrary to me, my brother in France does not speak about it does not like to go to the synagogue, does not totally different than what I do. Wonderful person, but he's got his very, he's got his principle and his reasons for not wanting to. So his son, uh, is very, he's brought up in a Jewish home, uh, but uh, knows about my mother, knows that she went to the Shoah, but I think the only one that really knows the details of the family is actually thanks to the lady a lady, the lady who took care of my mother uh, when my mother came out of Bergen-Belsen. And the la that lady was called Lina Galasso Delfini. She took her in her midst, is that an English word? And uh, she saw that what she went through was very important. So she made my mother talk and she wrote. And whatever I know, whatever details I know from Auschwitz, although it doesn't translate what she saw, because there's no way I can do it. It's thanks to Mrs. Lina uh, Galasso Delfini, who actually made my mother talk. So that testimony was done in 1945, at the end of 1945. So what, when you read through the testimony, yes. what elements do you talk about when you talk about your mother's story? Do you is there certain episodes in her life from 1943 to 1945 that are in the testimony that you, when you talk about it, you feel are important for people to, to hear about? Sure, sure. The first thing that I discover is that they were taken from Rhodes. The whole deportation was done within four days. There was nothing before that showed any animosity, even from the Germans that were here, towards the Jews. So they knew nothing. My mother says, we didn't even know there was a war we knew, but we had even heard of camps. We didn't know about Jews being transferred. This is one of the things that I, 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 I remember. On top of it, when they were arrested, 
they were put in uh, l'aeronautica that was the central area uh, uh, naval command in uh, here outside roads and the moment they went in there they were never uh, they, know, they were not allowed to go out but that's beside the point what also shocks me is that the Germans what they did they blew the alarm on that day that was the 23rd of July at dawn so that the non-Jews would rush to the cellars to the not the cellars to the shelters, shelters so they would not witness that the Jews were taken away three boats were waiting for them but every time she recalls in the testimony she keeps on telling and telling were always in rows of five and effectively from the minute she lives here they're in rows of five when she speaks that they are the call up in Auschwitz they are in rows of five when they were whatever they did was always in rows of five it was something amazing and she said uh, when they entered Auschwitz for example there were three sisters the mother was immediately killed but she always spoke of the one sister, Matilda. Matilda said, and mom kept on saying that, my, ma my sister did not survive because she was heartbroken. She was heartbroken because she was engaged to an Italian. And you know, in those days to get married across the faith was difficult. And my mom kept on saying, in the train that were taking them to Auschwitz, her mother said, why I didn't let you go with the Italian? So the minute they entered Auschwitz, mom always said, Matilda knew that she would not make it. Although she was, when the, they were made to be uh, selection. the selection, the three sisters were sent to work, Matilda said, I will not make it. And effectively, uh, she spoke about it. And what she spoke inspired me to write a poem on her, although I never heard, never seen her, heard of her, but felt very close to that lady, to that sister of her that was 21. And the amazing thing is that I didn't know the name of the Italian soldier. And now I've written a poem on Mati. It's a, it's a poem that's quite sad, but about love, love that cannot bloom. And after the book is published, uh, I decide to look in my mother's uh, uh, cases where uh, maybe I should start clearing things. And what do I discover? I found a yellow page. The man, the man that she spoke, I never knew his name was Giuseppe Russo. And he says, I, Giuseppe Russo, surgeon of the Italian Navy, I've got the, 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 Italian, the original paper, where he gives all the jewellery that they entrusted him before they went, he gives it to the British army. So because he's leaving back to Italy, not knowing that my mother has survived. And this has a stamp of the British that they take all the, their, uh, all these, uh, the jewellery, whatever they gave him. And when my mom went to Italy and she enters into contact with him because he was from Naples. He actually couldn't believe it. So she went to him to spend two weeks with, her fam with his family and the only thing that he kept was the dress, one of the dress of the girl he loved. And that's the only thing that was left from her. This is one of the things. So I can go on this. Well, tell me what, um, what moral values from these stories have you learned uh, that motivate you? Are there particular elements in, in the story of your, your mother's life that uh, motivates you? Uh, uh, a little bit stuck there. So if you, if you were, to, if you were uh, looking at, for example, uh, elements of courage. Uh, do you think that you look at the, the life of your mother and those two years that she spent um, and does it help you to 
understand what courage means, does it understand what loyalty means, what uh, love means, when you look at the, the, the stories of your well, mother. When I look at the stories of my mother, I, I see, okay, for me, yes, I know that my duty is to actually speak to people, not to be racist, not to be xenophobic, all these type of things, because that's what they went through. But the memories I've got of the after is a mother that was very anxious, a mother that went through four or five nervous breakdowns. I don't know if these were the reasons or not, because I cannot, I will not know that. Uh, and also, I don't know if I should say that, but she wasn't a woman that actually, I don't know if I should say that actually, that, that would come and cuddle us and kiss us and, and I don't know if, if I missed maybe that or sometimes I used to see other parents, the way they used to cuddle their children and she was a little bit, I wouldn't say distance. I don't know if I should even mention what I'm saying that because she loved us, she did everything, but she didn't show it. Was it the result of that? I don't know. I don't even know if I say I'm, I'm, I'm right by saying this. To no, you. it's very, it's very. I don't know. Very important. I don't know. Very important. I don't know if this is a consequence. Nobody will know. We know that they came out of the camps. There were no psychologists, no psychiatrists. They just had to shut up because nobody could understand. Nobody. Okay, that's good.